Good evening, everybody. Thank you again for attending another session of our SALT Talks. Um, my name is Patty Schramm. I'm the Parent Resource Trainer Coordinator for the SALT Talks. Um, this month, we are focusing on, um, we're looking at guardianship tonight, but for the month, we are focusing on what happens, what's, what happens when we're going, how do we plan for this future planning? Um, how to prepare when I'm going, gone. Uh, parents, especially with like individuals that with disabilities or if you're caring for somebody, you not only have to plan for the here and now, but you have to plan for when you're not here anymore, which can be tricky because you got to figure out in the future, you know, what does that look like? You know, what does that look like for my son, my daughter? You know, there's many, many aspects, you know, housing, you know, work. Will they be able to? Will they not be able to? There's many factors to take in, into consideration in there. So tonight we are touching on guardianship and the alternatives. Um, I know guardianship is one of those hurdles that many of you maybe have just started thinking about or maybe didn't think about and said, oh, you know, maybe we should start thinking about it. Um, but it's one of those steps that you're not quite sure how to step forward in. So we wanted to touch on that tonight as we start this looking at the future planning process. Now we have the, we have tonight, we have, um, she's an attorney, Brittany, Brittany Ad Adime. I'm sorry, I always pronounce your name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have her talking tonight, um, addressing the guardianship um, and that whole process. Now next week, we'll also be touching on supported decision-making and then following at the end of the month, we'll be talking about the stable account and then the special needs trusts. So we have a jam pack. This, this whole month is packed full of information. So um, as we go about tonight, if you want to drop your questions in the chat, feel free. Um, Brittany, that's up to you how you want to take their questions, if you want to take them as we go or just at I'll the end. I'll take them as we go, um, unless it's something I'm going to touch on, then I'll let you know, hey, I'm going to get to that. So good good question. I'll get there. But Okay, great. Um, we are recording tonight, just to let everybody know. Um, if for some reason, I know there's storms going on um, throughout the Midwest here, um, but if for some reason we drop, you know, I am recording as much as we can get through tonight. Um, but if for some reason something disconnects, we'll get together again with Brittany. I don't want to sec for, you know, we'll have to just reschedule, but I just wanted to get that warning out there. We'll try to get it done tonight as much as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brittany and let you introduce yourself and get started with the presentation. Well, thank you, Patty. And like Patty said, my name is Brittany Odiam, and I'm with the law firm of Odiam and Estes Law Group, and we're in Centerville, so just south of Dayton. And um, as a firm, we really have a very narrow focus. We focus really only on planning. Um, and what I mean by that is we handle the full spectrum of estate planning. So whether it's, you know, setting up wills and trusts um, on the basic end, all the way up to more complex asset protection and tax planning and everything that falls in between. And what that allows us to do is dive a lot deeper into some of the more um, nuanced areas of planning. Um, such as elder law, so we do a lot of, you know, Medicaid planning and long-term care assistance and all of that. And then on the special needs planning side, we do a lot on, um, on uh, the special needs trust planning, um, helping protect benefits, and the guardianship side of things. So tonight, we're here to talk about guardianships. And if you bear with me for just a moment, I'm going to share my screen. They always change these things around on me. So just a moment, let me find where it's at now. Mm -mm, okay. Share my screen and get to my PowerPoint. And get this started. Okay. So, um, like I said, we're here to talk about guardianships, but the guardianship isn't going to be our only focus because guardianships are an alternative um, when we're talking about somebody who is 
kind of aging out of the um, the school system and getting to that 18 point and trying to figure out, you know, how do we best support them? How do we best make sure that there's a, a good, safe structure that people are able to help them moving forward? So guardianship is one of those things, but we're also going to talk about powers of attorney and kind of the nuances between that and when one might be more appropriate than the other and, and so forth. So um, as an attorney, I have to warn you, this isn't legal advice, right? <laughs> this is uh, generalized um, information. Um, what's really fun about my job is that every single client is different. It would be very boring if every single family came in and needed the exact same thing and every child was the same and every parent was the same. But that's obviously not the case. So um, I'm going to give really general advice and general information tonight, but I, I strongly encourage you to make sure that you're talking with a qualified attorney about your particular circumstances so that you can make sure that what you're doing is best for what you, um, you individually need. Okay, so our primary question when we're looking at um, guardianships versus powers of attorney and all of that is how do we create the best structure to allow somebody to act on behalf of another person um, and help them with their financial and their healthcare decision making overall. Um, sometimes that help means actually supplanting their ability to make those decisions and sometimes that help just means coming alongside of them and supporting them in making their own decisions. So we'll kind of, like I said, dive into some of the nuances on when one structure is more appropriate than the other. And our two main options to get there are powers of attorney and guardianships. And we're going to start um, by just looking at you know, the overall rules um, and contrast, you know, hey, when when do the guardianship rules apply? Um, and if they don't apply, when does a power of attorney become appropriate? And then what myths and misunderstandings do we need to just kind of debunk tonight so that we can look at this with more clear eyes under today's rules and not, you know, what might have happened with your neighbor's uncle's <laughs> second cousin's kid or something like that. Um, so we're going to start with the big picture. Um, Everything that we're talking about tonight, everything in the entire decision making process when it comes to guardianships and powers of attorney is first and foremost looking at what is in the best interest of the individual that we're planning for. Okay, um, so that's going to be different for every single person. And when we're talking about best interest, it's not just, you know, what, what does mom and dad think are best? That's obviously an element there because you guys are in the position of having raised them and, and having um, put them put a structure around them that we need to kind of help promote um, and continue. But we want to look at the, the the safety of the individual. You know, what's what's their care setting? Do they need a care setting? Are they going to be able to live independently? What kind of supports do they need in that um, and why? You know, is it this is the best care setting because it's the most convenient for me or is this the best care setting because it's going to be a setting in which they can thrive and and do well? Um, <coughs> excuse me. We're looking at their overall well-being as well. So um, happiness and peace of mind and all of those things are just as important as other aspects of health. Um, you know, it's easy to look at the numbers or look at the logistics and focus on that, but we always need to take a step back and look at quality of life, right? Um, what's gonna make this person happy? What's gonna make them thrive? What's gonna bring them the highest level of, um, you know, peace in their life that we could possibly promote. And we need to actually, you know, focus on that as a, as a priority. And then independence. Um, it's a really difficult thing to consider, you know, looking at removing somebody's liberty to make their own decisions, right? And so we don't take that lightly. We always want to try to find our least intrusive alternative that we can still promote this individual's ability to make decisions for themselves where they safely can. And that's gonna be so different for everybody, but we wanna make sure that we're not completely stripping somebody of all independence um, unnecessarily. Oh, sorry, my, there we go. Um, so we're, we'll start with powers of attorney. So powers of attorney are basically a, a way, a legal document that you can put in place to have somebody stand in your shoes and help take care of things for you. That's what it boils down to. Um, real quick before I get in this, I'm trying to make sure that I can see the chat and I'm not able to see it right now. So I'm trying to figure out how to get it up. So just bear with me a moment. I wanna make sure that I don't miss anything that you guys might be saying. Are I can watch the chat for you and okay, just alert, and alert you if there's any questions out there. Okay, I'll do that then. Oops, I'm okay. sorry, I have to go, go to the beginning. Okay, 
So with powers of attorney, there's two main types of powers of attorney. Um, you have your financial power of attorney and your healthcare power of attorney. And in Ohio, they are two separate documents. Um, a lot of times we'll see, you know, I think other states or online forms or something like that that will uh, try to put them into one document. But in Ohio, we do have those as two separate documents. So that's something just to be, um, be aware of and be on the lookout for. We'll start on the financial uh, power of attorney side of things. These are often called durable general powers of attorney. And um, essentially, they're pretty broad in what they're able to do, but what they say is what they can do. And what I mean by that is that just having a power of attorney in and of itself isn't enough to say, well, then I've got a power of attorney, so I can do all of these things. The power of attorney only gives the agent the authority that is expressly written in the document. So it's really important to read the document and make sure that it says what you need it to say, um, that it allows you to do what you're trying to do and that you're not kind of overstepping uh, the bounds of what that might be. And that's one reason that I would encourage you, you know, if if powers of attorney end up being the route that seem to be the most appropriate. One thing that I would encourage you to do is make sure that when you're setting up with that, that power of attorney, work with somebody that has a good grasp, a good understanding of um, some of the other special considerations that come along uh, with, you know, raising an adult child with developmental disabilities or helping them through uh, different phases of their lives so that you can make sure that your power of attorney is going to say everything that you need it to say. Um, Powers of attorney can be durable or non-durable. So, I have yet to see a non-durable power of attorney. (laughs) Um, What durable means is that it continues to be um, effective even if you become incompetent, okay? Um, Most, if it was non-durable, it would would stop being effective when somebody becomes incompetent, which kind of seems counterintuitive, right? (laughs) If I have this document, I want it in place so that I'm able to um, continue to handle this no matter what might come up in the future. So again, non-durable powers of attorney are not something you're often going to see. Springing versus immediate. This is oftentimes something that surprises people, but most powers of attorney are called, uh, are considered to be immediate powers of attorney. What that means is that they are effective immediately upon signing them. Okay, so they don't require that somebody become incompetent before that person's, um, that agent's authority takes place. Um, if, if there's something in the document that says, this agent has authority uh, to, to do all of these things only if I become incompetent, then that makes it a springing power of attorney. Um, I have seen those, those are less common um, simply because sometimes when we're using powers of attorney, it's not because somebody is not capable of doing things on their own. It's just that they're maybe not um, not currently available or maybe they just don't want to. Um, examples of that, you know, could look like if you're traveling, okay? Um, my brother, he got, he, well, in my family, I'm a second generation estate planning attorney. So when we turned 18, it was happy birthday, sign your will. Okay, so we all got, Um, our estate plans when we turned 18 and um, so and that included powers of attorney and my brother got his power of attorney when he turned 18 and a couple years later right after 9-11 he uh, enlisted in the army and when he was at basic training his identity was stolen and uh, because my parents had his power of attorney they were able to go to the bank work with the bank and make sure all of that was handled without um, him actually losing out on anything um, so it's not that he was incompetent, it was just that he was unavailable and they were able to jump in and take care of that for him and stand in his shoes. Um, my grandfather, when he was towards the end of his life, he was still mentally sharp as a tack. <laughs> that man never lost lost a, a bit of his capacity, but uh, physically he had a lot of limitations because he had Parkinson's d- disease. And so um, towards, you know, as the disease progressed and it was more difficult for him to go out and do things, um, he ta- tagged me in as his power of attorney and say, hey, go do this for me. Not because he wasn't mentally capable of doing so, but because physically it was difficult for him. So he just needed the help. So most of these um, are more appropriate to be immediate because we are not necessarily only needing this if I become incompetent at some point in the future. So, um, and then they're also general versus limited. And what that's gonna basically look at is what powers are given, right? Sometimes you'll see powers of attorney that are really only for a very narrow focus. 
Maybe they're really um, intended only to be used for real estate purposes, or they're intended only to be used for the, the BMV. The BMV has its own limited power of attorney that they like people to use. Um, general powers of attorney, though, are more broad in scope. They're covering a multitude of things um, from you know banking or mail or digital assets or signing contracts or dealing with real estate or whatever might come up. But again, even with a general power of attorney, we always need to make sure that we're looking at the document and seeing what it says, because what it says is what it's enabling the agent to do. Okay. Um, the other side of the power of attorney coin is a healthcare power of attorney. And as the name implies, those are only for healthcare related decisions. So a healthcare power of attorney is naming somebody to stand in your shoes and help make healthcare decisions for you if you're not able to yourself. One thing that's often or that's um, important to emphasize on this is that having a healthcare power of attorney doesn't take away your healthcare decision making. It just says if I'm not able to, then here's who's going to step in. Um, it doesn't require that you become incompetent in order to meet the if I'm not able to. It might be that you're on, unconscious or whatever conditions going on, you're just not capable of understanding. Um, but but it doesn't supplant the individual's decision making necessarily. Okay. Oftentimes you'll see healthcare powers of attorney are paired with living wills. And a living will is one of the only documents in an estate planner's world where we're not naming somebody to make a decision for you. Okay. So it's a directive straight from you to your doctors where you're making the decisions for yourself. And essentially what a living will says is, um, you know, if two doctors determine that I'm, you know, permanently unconscious and I'm in a terminal state, then at that point, nobody else has to decide anything. My healthcare power of attorney no longer has to decide anything because I've decided I don't want extraordinary measures. But I do want all the comfort care. So give me all the pain meds, make sure that I'm kept comfortable, but don't keep me artificially alive on a, on a ventilator or something like that if there's nothing that can really medically be done to change the circumstance. So you'll often see those, uh, those paired, the healthcare power of attorney and the living will. Um, but they're not both mandatory. So it's, it's kind of an individual decision at that point. There is a question, Brittany, oh, yes. on the power of, uh, does the healthcare power of attorney get access to all of your medical records? Um, a well-written healthcare power of attorney does <laughs> give access to your medical records. What we look for in that is a HIPAA waiver. Um, so HIPAA is the privacy rule, the federal privacy rules that um, the doctors are going to want to see a waiver of those privacy rules in order for the agent to access uh, medical records. So simply being named the agent isn't enough uh, to give automatic access to that. We need to have that HIPAA waiver language in there. Um, and that needs to be initialed off on even separately so that the, the uh, person executing the healthcare power of attorney understands that, hey, by doing this, I'm giving this person the authority to um, review my medical records and speak with my physicians and get all of the information that I have access to. Um, you can also see HIPAA waivers as their own standalone document. So they might, um, you know, it, they may be listed in the healthcare power of attorney or they might be their own standalone document that you fill out separately. And oftentimes those are helpful that uh, if, in situations where maybe um, you want more people to have access to your medical records than just your agent. So I might have, you know, my son as my healthcare agent, but I want to make sure all my kids have access to my medical records. So I might sign a separate HIPAA waiver for each of them. So it's clear that I want the doctors to be able to communicate and share information with all of them, even if my son is my decision maker. Okay, hopefully that helps. Um, powers of attorney are wonderful, but they do have their limits. Okay. Um, one of the most relevant limits for tonight's conversation is uh, the first on this bullet point list is that in order for a power of attorney to be effective, the individual creating the power of attorney has to be competent to create it. So they have to have the, the requisite capacity to create it. And capacity is such a an obscure thing, right? <laughs> There's no bright line, uh, you know, rule that we can say, okay, well, here's the test. And if you get three out of four, then you're, you're confident. And if you don't, you're, you're incompetent. Um, when it comes to capacity to create a power of attorney, uh, what we're looking for is that the person's actually understanding what they're doing. Um, not only do they understand the basics of what a power of attorney is, 
but um, they understand, yeah, this is the person that I want to serve in that role. And I understand that by signing this, I'm giving them these authorities that are listed. And this does correctly reflect what my wishes are. And I'm not signing it just because somebody put it in front of me and said, hey, you should sign this. So um, when we're talking with uh, people and, and going through the process of executing powers of attorney, that's one reason that we have witnesses and notaries involved so that people are there to um, kind of attest to the individual's capacity to create that document um, so that if there's a challenge or something on it later, um, there's some kind of record of, of what was going on and that this individual did appear to understand what was happening. Um, now, if they're competent when they create it and they become incompetent, like we just talked about, the power of attorney can continue. A power of attorney is only good as long as that person is living. So it does terminate the minute that somebody passes away. Um, one thing that's also kind of rolls into this is that um, when a power of attorney is created by somebody who is competent to create a power of attorney, um, if they are competent to create a power of attorney and they later decide to revoke the power of attorney and they're competent to make that revocation, then they can do that. So there's nothing that kind of locks you in with the power of attorney, um, whereas, you know, you might have a have a fight someday or have a, a shift in the relationship or whatever that might look like and somebody could change their mind and say no you know what I don't really want mom to serve in this role or I really don't want dad on this list anymore and they can always take it back and and take that power away and maybe give it to somebody else or maybe not have one at all so that's something to be just you know cognizant of as you're as you're evaluating this um, they have to be properly executed. So I already mentioned, you know, we have witnesses and notaries to kind of attest to the circumstances of what's going on when this is executed. And they have to have an agent that's actually willing to do it, right? <laughs> Just because somebody names you as their agent under your power, under their power of attorney, doesn't mean you have to do it, right? You always have the option to decline. And even if you start serving, you have the op option to resign. So that's why we always encourage people to have a few agents listed. Um, so that we've got backup people that we can tag in if something happens and somebody's no longer able to serve or they're not able to able or willing to serve when their name um, comes up on the list. Um, one thing that really makes powers of attorney kind of tricky in Ohio right now is this next bullet point, which is financial institutions don't actually have to accept them. So when it comes to financial powers of attorney, banks and places like that do get to choose whether or not they accept your power of attorney. So there's nothing in Ohio law that says that they're really enforceable. Um, it's always been like this, so this is not new <laughs> information, but what's happened, the reason this has, be, um, has become kind of an issue is that I'd say over the last, I don't know, maybe six or seven years, the trend has been that banks are getting more and more strict about when they will accept a power of attorney. And I think a lot of that is in response to some of the unfortunate problems that we're seeing with people misusing powers of attorney, right, and abusing the authorities that are given. And um, in many cases, though, banks have kind of swung the pendulum too far the other direction and made it difficult to use them even in legitimate circumstances. So every bank gets to choose for themselves. They get to set their own rules as to when they will or won't accept a power of attorney. They all tend to do it pretty differently and they tend to change their minds pretty regularly. So it's a great way to make sure that I'm, I, I'm crazy at all times. Um, most of the time, the, the rules that banks use on this are related to the age of the document. So they'll say, oh, well, I can't accept this power of attorney because it was signed more than you know three years ago or more than five years ago. Um, that time frame seems to be getting shorter and shorter. We just had a bank tell us that they couldn't accept a power of attorney because it had been signed more than six months prior and it was six months and one day old. <laughs> and the lady had to come back in and sign a whole new power of attorney in order for the bank to accept it. So it is something to be aware of that there are wonderful planning tools, but they're not necessarily foolproof in, in all situations. Um, I'm gonna pause real quick and go to the message in the chat. I did figure out how to get those. So the, the question here is if a power of attorney is valid at death, is invalid at death, what do you need in place for someone to settle estates and financial issues after death? And that um, is when we get into the process of estate administration using somebody's will. So if they passed away with a will, um, anything that has to go through probate, the will would name who the executor is and that's who's stepping in to manage all of that. Um, they might have a trust and in that case, we're not going through probate and we're using the trustee with that authority to handle those things. Um, it gets tricky when there's assets that are not going through probate, but there's no trust involved, and maybe they're not going through probate because there was joint ownership, 
or there was a direct beneficiary designation or something along those lines. And in those situations, the joint owner or the direct beneficiary are the people that have the ability to step in and manage each of those assets, which could be different people. Um, harder way to make sure that bills are paid when we're working with so many cooks in the kitchen, but that's kind of where we do that passing of the torch from the power of attorney to whatever document is, is coming into play next. Um, another potential drawback on powers of attorney, I wouldn't say this is always a drawback, but one potential drawback on powers of attorney is that there's no third party oversight. Okay, so it's really important to make sure that the people that you're naming to serve as agents under this are people that you trust to do the right thing. Okay, don't name people just because they happen to be your closest relative, right? <laughs> um, I always talk to parents, you know, who are setting their own up and naming maybe their kids and they're just naming them in age order because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, even though maybe their third child would be the, the best suited and their first child really shouldn't have access to some of this information. So it's important to look beyond just relationship and look at capabilities and trustworthiness and making sure that these are the right people uh, to put in there. And, and there is accountability in there. Um, there's no third party oversight, but we always encourage you to write in some accountability standards in your power of attorney. So ours say that the agent is accountable, not just to the, the principal, the person that created the power of attorney, but also to the other people that are named as agents. So they've got to be able to show their work and be able to justify what they're doing. It's not just a um, blank check to go do whatever you want and nobody can can say anything about it. Um, and then there's often no method for determination of incompetency, um, which is fine in general, except when we get to the situation where we actually need to override somebody's wishes. Okay, so if somebody was competent to create the power of attorney, they have a willing agent that's willing to serve, all of the um, formalities of execution were met, and this has been trucking along just fine. Everything's everything's good. Um, but maybe we get to the point where the principal has some diminished capacity. You know, there there's something going on that their their uh, competency is waning, and um, it's to a point where the the agent under the power of attorney really needs to step in and and kind of take over and maybe remove some of the principal's decision making or override maybe bad decisions that the principal is making. Uh, that's where things get a little harried. And even when we have powers of attorney that might have been working beautifully all along, um, if we get into that situation, what you're often going to find is that a bank or someplace like that will pump the brakes and say, wait a second, this power of attorney is no longer going to be honored unless you have a guardian um, in place because now we need a, a, def, a delineation of, of who's supposed to be making the decisions here. And this can be a really difficult thing because um, you know it, it, it always comes with emotional tolls. It always comes, it appears to come in the most inconvenient of situations where bills need to be paid and now we can't um, access the, the, the money or on the healthcare side where we've got to get somebody into a care facility and maybe it's against their will, but it's really where they need to be in order to have a safe care setting. Um, but the care facility won't accept them against their will without a guardianship um, or some sort of court order um, enforcing that decision. So that's where, you know, some of our limits are, are found with our, our powers of attorney. And in that context, um, we are looking to, okay, well, what do we do next? And um, there we go. Um, so that's when we start looking at, is guardianship a, a viable option or is it an appropriate option? Um, so, you know, maybe the person isn't, isn't competent at the outset. They can't sign the power of attorney to start with. So that's a non-starter at the, at the outset and we have to go shift, shift our focus towards the guardianship side. Or is there that need for involuntary institutionalization? So like I just said, we need to move them to a care setting against their will and um, we need to have a court determine that that's the, the appropriate thing to do um, or just override bad decision making. And this is, a, I would, I want to stress this for a moment because especially as parents, I think this is something that's really difficult um, in any context. I don't care who your kid is. It's really hard to let them grow and it's really hard to let them fail, right? And um, one of the hallmarks of being competent um, if you have capacity to make decisions for yourself, that means you also have are entitled to make bad decisions for yourself, right? We don't all get it right every time. And there are times that 
it's really hard to set aside, sit aside and watch somebody make bad decisions and find where's that balance? Where's that line where a bad decision is actually a, um, a sign, a flag coming up showing lack of capacity versus just a bad decision? You know, I really want to give all of these strangers $10,000. I really want to, you know, send this mon money off to a Nigerian prince because he seems like he really needs it. You know, where where is that that line where um, decision making is bad and it shows incapacity versus decision making is bad and you're entitled to do it because you're confident. So that's a, a really tricky thing that oftentimes comes up. Um, other things that we're looking for on on bridging this gap here is, is there any kind of undue influence happening? You know, do you have somebody chirping in, in their ear uh, trying to get them to do something that is showing that maybe they don't have the mental fortitude to withstand influence. They might understand how to balance a checkbook and how to create a budget and things like that, but maybe they don't have the fortitude to uh, discern, hey, this is good advice versus this is somebody taking advantage of me. So is there that undue influence that's going to make them too susceptible to exploitation or other types of financial abuse um, that might warrant having a guardianship in place. Um, so we look at the, the external circumstances as well as what's happening with the individual. Um, and when we decide, okay, based on those factors, we really do need to look at something in, that's an alternative to a power of attorney. Um, the two things that oftentimes come up are guardianships and conservatorships. And I will tell you, it is rare to see a conservatorship come up. Conservatorships are um, are available in Ohio. They're just not commonly used. Um, a conservatorship is essentially a guardianship for somebody who is mentally competent, okay? So to flip that for a moment, a guardianship is a process of managing um, an individual's person or their estate um, when they're incompetent, which under Ohio law means that they are under the age of 18 but they own property, um, or they are over the age of 18, but they uh, are mentally incompetent, or they are incarcerated. Those are those are the elements of capacity uh, for uh, under Ohio law. And this is something that requires then probate court supervision of the entire process. Um, we're gonna go through what the, the application process and everything looks like here in a moment, but we have to actually prove that competence at the outset to make sure that this is the appropriate um, avenue to be going down. Conservatorship is the same thing. You're naming somebody to stand in and, and manage this, and they're doing it with probate court oversight. But the flip side here is it's it's essentially a voluntary guardianship because the conservator or the the um, ward in that case is competent. We're not saying that they are mentally incompetent and this is why they need this. We're saying this person's competent, but they don't want to do it or they want to have this person appointed, but they also want the court to oversee it. So as you can imagine, those circumstances are more rare because it usually in those circumstances we're using a power of attorney, but there can be pretty powerful uses for it. It just doesn't come up too often. Um, before we get too deep into the guardianship process, I'll give a quick little overview of some of the vocabulary so that I'm not just throwing out words that might not make sense. Um, the ward is the person for whom the guardianship is sought or the person for uh, that is the subject of the guardianship once it's in place. So the individual that is um, incapacitated either because of age or because of mental capacity or incarceration. Um, the applicant is the person who's applying to be the guardian. So you're not the guardian until the court says you're the guardian. Um, even if you're nominated in, in a document somewhere, it doesn't happen until the court says it happens. Um, so you're just the applicant until that appointment has been made. And then once that appointment has been made, um, you become the official guardian. Um, with, and one thing to keep in mind with, with that is that when, if I'm named as somebody's guardian, that doesn't make me the end all be all of that person forever. What actually happens is that the probate court becomes that individual, the ward's superior guardian. So the guardian's role is really to act more as a liaison between the ward and the probate court so that the probate court can have a clear picture of what's going on and make sure that things are being handled in the best manner for that individual. Um, question I see in the chat here is, do you see conservatorships for high functioning autistic transitioning adults? Um, yes, I have seen that. What, what we typically see conservatorships in, um, to be honest, is usually people that have severe, uh, severe physical limitations, but not necessarily mental limitations. 
um, where they need to have a little bit more of a structure, or maybe they don't have a family or something around that's really appropriate to serve as guardians, or I'm sorry, to serve under powers of attorney, but um, need to have some sort of structure. So uh, having a conservatorship is a little bit more appropriate. Um, oftentimes, when I've got a lot of high functioning um, clients, that, young adult clients that are somewhere on the autism spectrum or, you know, have other other diagnoses where they're high functioning, but they still need the help. And where we usually start, if, if it's appropriate based on the, an evaluation of the circumstances, we usually start with the power of attorney. And sometimes it works beautifully. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, you know, after a couple years of it working beautifully, it might, something might come up um, where we realize, okay, well, this, this, <laughs> It served its purpose and we've we've tested it, but now it's clear that a guardianship is needed. But um, usually powers of attorney are where we would start in that context um, to make sure that there's uh, as little invasion of of liberty and as little oversight and expense for the family as 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 possible, as safely possible, I should say. So hopefully that helps answer that. All right. When we're looking at guardianship um, from the ground floor, that there's four main goals that we're looking at in evaluating um, whether a guardianship is appropriate. And these are the same four goals that a court is evaluating when they're evaluating the application and deciding whether or not to appoint somebody as guardian. The very first question um, is whether or not the ward is actually incompetent, because if the answer to this question is no, that they're not incompetent because they are competent, then the buck stops there and a guardianship is going to be thrown out because it's not appropriate for an individual who is competent. Um, incompetency, like we've talked about, is, is a really amorphous thing. It is not something that we can clearly just say, okay, well, here's our, our criteria and check the boxes. Um, because the, somebody might be incompetent for some things, but not necessarily incompetent for all things. So we always want to take a really deep look at, um, at that individual's capabilities um, and, and not cast too wide of a net just because they may struggle in one area, but do they struggle in all? Um, and we'll talk about the process of how a court determines whether or not somebody is incompetent. And um, one thing to note is that being, being designated incompetent is a legal finding. So the only way that somebody is legally incompetent is if the probate judge says that they are. So a doctor's, um, a doctor's evaluation of capacity um, does not lead to a finding of incompetence unless a court has made that final determination. So just food for thought. Um, the next thing, so let's say we, we determine, okay, this person is incompetent, guardianship seems to be appropriate, let's move forward. The next thing we will look at is, is the, are there any less intrusive alternatives to guardianship? Because again, we don't want to take away somebody's liberty to make decisions on their own unless we absolutely have to, okay? Um, less intrusive alternatives are often going to look like things like powers of attorney. Are there powers of attorney in place that this person might have created when they were competent? That instead of using a guardianship, maybe, maybe we just have the court uh, give us an order that enforces the power of attorney. Um, that happens a lot when we have banks that won't accept a power of attorney. We can go to the court and say, hey, this power of attorney was valid when it was signed. This, this is working beautifully. We just need some sort of enforcement. And the court might just say, okay, we're going to issue an order that this power of attorney be honored. Um, less alternatives to, and less intrusive alternatives to guardianship are also sometimes just a limitation of the guardianship. Right. Rather than a plenary guardianship that this this guardian is going to have um, control over every aspect of the ward's life. Um, are there ways that we can limit that? Are there, there are ways that we can carve out where their needs are versus where their strengths are and preserve their ability to control those strengths and give a, a structure around um, where they need help um, rather than taking away all liberty? The next one is, is the applicant, is the person applying, is this person the best person to serve as the guardian? So, you know, if we, this person needs a guardian because they're incompetent and there are no less intrusive alternatives, we still need to evaluate, is the applicant the best person for the job? Is there somebody else that might be more suitable? There may be competing applications, right? It could be that we have different family members applying to serve as guardian uh, for that ward. And so the court is also looking at, is this going to be the best thing? And um, as we go through the guardianship process, I'll show you a couple ways that the court evaluates that with background checks and things like that to make sure that they've got 
all of the information that they need about that applicant to make sure that they're not putting somebody in a role that's maybe not appropriate uh, for what they need. So, um, and then ultimately it all goes back to what we talked about at the outset. What is ultimately going to be in the best interest of the ward? Because that is going to be the paramount uh, concern. So even if this applicant, for instance, might be a good person, might be financially responsible, might, you know, on paper be, be fine for the job, but maybe they have a really rough relationship with the applicants, is putting this person in, in a decision-making authority over the over the ward um, going to be detrimental to that person's personal well-being? You know, or is it going to be detrimental to their relationship? Or what other personal elements do we need to consider um, in deciding whether this, this is the appropriate way to go? What is in the best interest of the ward? Because we want to make sure that that is always going to be protected and preserved. I'll look to the chat real quick. Um, we've con been considering a power of attorney for our cognitively impaired son because we think he can handle most things and we want to tread lightly on his liberty. However, we've been advised uh, Ohio Medicaid CMH will only accept guardianship after he's 18. Um, so I'm, I, I think that this means that Ohio Medicaid won't accept a power of attorney. Um, that's not true in all cases, although I will say with any kind of governmental authority when you're talking about Social Security, when you're talking about Medicaid, when you're talking about even, um, you know, veterans benefits, things like that. Um, they have the discretion to, to deny powers of attorney. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have a guardianship. It just means that the individual then would have to be a participant in the decision making there. Okay. So um, the individual should still be able to authorize somebody to act on their behalf. So for instance, um, I do a lot of Medicaid applications that involve um, nursing homes, right? And in nursing home, in the nursing home context, I can't just hand hand our caseworker a power of attorney and say this is the person that's doing everything. Instead, they have a specific form. I have to name somebody as the authorized representative on the case. That if if the individual that is applying for Medicaid isn't the one handling the correspondence with the caseworker, then they have to have somebody that's named as an authorized representative to act on their behalf. Um, so that could be the the difference in what we're talking about here. That you could still have a power of attorney, but maybe your child in that context also needs to uh, to name you as an authorized representative or something of that nature, so that they have the ability to. Um, speak with you and allow you to make decisions. On the Social Security side, um, you're looking at representative payees and things like that, rather than uh, a power of attorney or a guardian necessarily in that context. So it just depends on the program and what, what nuances <laughs> they might have that we have to factor into the, the puzzle that is this whole system. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Um, all right. When we're determining whether or not somebody is actually incompetent, um, Ohio law defines incompetent as any person who is mentally so mentally impaired as a result or me of mental or physical illness or disability or mental retardation or as a result of chronic substance abuse that the person's incapable of taking proper care of their self or their property or they fail to provide for their family or other people for whom that they are, whom they are charged to uh, provide by law. Um, or any person who's combined to a correctional institution within the state. So um, I hate this definition personally. I think it's I think it's poorly poorly written. I, I take issue with the point that it mentions uh, physical illness and disability as a determination of incompetency, because certainly somebody can be physically very disabled and still have full cognitive ability. And I've worked with a couple clients who have had guardianships filed against them where the ward was physically very, um, very impaired and maybe even verbally very impaired, but mentally were still in the right position to be making their own decisions. And so in those contexts, I'm kind of pushing back against that and saying, no, we are competent. Here's all of the factors for why. So something to keep in mind is that the ward always has the right to prove that they are mentally competent. Okay. Just because somebody files a guardianship application doesn't mean that um, we're just going to take it at face value that whatever information or evidence they presented is is what it is. The ward as a part of the guardianship process, since liberty is at stake, the ward always has the the right, first of all, of representation, 
Um, they have a right to present witnesses and evidence of their own capacity so they can basically counteract or contradict anything and the burden of proof proving that somebody is incompetent is going to be on the applicant. So, um, so this is an important factor. Um, you don't see it as frequently in the context of um, guardianships for developmentally disabled um, young adults, but we see it a lot more in the context of um, elderly guardianships where somebody's maybe on that borderline and they don't think they're quite there yet. And so they, they jump in to um, contest the guardianship and say, no, I'm not, I don't need one. I'm competent. And these are the people that I want to be making decisions for me. So it's an important, uh, important piece of the puzzle there. So if we've determined based on those four criteria that a guardianship seems appropriate, um, we start looking into the process. And our starting point is figuring out what type of guardianship we even need, because it's not a one size fits all. Um, an unlimited guardianship, a plenary guardianship, is the kind of carte blanche guardianship over all things. Um, this is giving the, the guardian really unlimited authority over every aspect of the ward's um, estate, every aspect of the ward's person, and all decision making that might come up. Um, those certainly have their place. We certainly need those in some circumstances, but many times we're able to limit that, right? We're able to, like I said earlier, look at the individual and figure out, okay, you know, should they be able to um, drive? Should they be able to vote? Should they be able to get married? Should they be able to, um, you know, live independently? All of these things that um, this person might still be capable of doing, even if they can't make their own medical decisions, or even if they can't, you know, handle their own finances. There's a lot of ways that we need to dig deeper and um, really look at the at the person and not just the diagnosis. We look at the person and not just, you know, the circumstances and make sure that we are doing something that is appropriate and in the best interest of that individual and tailor this as much as we need to. Um, we also look at the guardianship um, context. So a guardianship is um, can be of, of somebody's person, which is all of their healthcare and custody and child, um, I'm sorry, uh, education and um, living arrangements, all of those kinds of things. Those are on our, our guardianship of the person side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the guardianship of the estate, which is a guardianship over anything that that individual owns. So naturally, if you have an individual who doesn't own anything, you know, a lot of times we see, um, young adults who are turning 18 and they don't necessarily have much to their name yet, right? They might have a small savings account from Christmas gifts from grandma or something that they've saved up over the years, but we're not usually talking about pieces of real estate or, um, you know, large sums of money and things like that. So in that context, most of our um, guardianships are going to start with the guardianship of the person. If we do have assets, you know, if we've got a small bank account or something of that nature, um, Oftentimes, the family, if they don't want to do a guardianship of the estate, um, what we might do is look at that bank account and say, well, gosh, he's got this $10,000 that he saved up from birthday gifts and all of that over the years. Um, rather than opening a guardianship of the estate, maybe it's more appropriate for that person to ha uh, put that money into a stable account. Or maybe that's more um, appropriate to have a special needs trust or something along those lines uh, to hold those kinds of funds. So I know Patty mentioned that so those are two topics that are going to be um, discussed um, in coming programming. So I'd encourage you to dig into those things because um, so much of this ties together, right? It's not just silos of here's guardianship and here's special needs trusts and here's stable accounts and here's Medicaid. It's all just one big tangled web. And so much of it can really benefit from the next. So sometimes we use uh, stable accounts and special needs trusts to um, avoid needing a, a guardianship of the estate because there's a less intrusive alternative to, to manage those. Um, so it might be it's a person only, or it might be it's an estate only. Maybe somebody already has a healthcare power of attorney that's working well, but they don't have a financial power of attorney. So we need to have a, a guardianship of the estate or whatever that might look like. There's also a process for emergency guardianship. Now these are, these are more rare. We have to tr prove an actual emergency, okay? So it's not just, well, shoot, they're gonna um, spend this money on this 
you know, car, this, this, this silly thing that I don't think they need to spend their money on. So I'm going to file a guardianship and, and uh, you know, make it an emergency so that they can't do it. Um, it has to be something that's, you know, an imminent threat of harm to their, their person or their finances that's going to be kind of irreparable if it's not managed right away. So there's a high threshold that we have to prove that there's, this, is, this is an actual emergency. What happens in the context of an emergency guardianship, if a court determines that, yes, the, the emergency does exist and we meet all of the criteria there, then um, somebody can be appointed as the emergency guardian for 72 hours. And within 72 hours, the court is going to require a hearing where you can present more evidence and the court can get eyes on things to figure out what's going on. And um, the court then has the discretion to extend that emergency guardianship for up to 30 more days. Okay, so you get the 72 hours extended to 30 days. But within that 30 days, then you have to file a full guardianship application. So within that 30 days, we have to have a full guardianship hearing and go through the process start to finish to make sure that we're not skipping any steps and that this is all in the best interest of the individual that needs it. Okay, so where do we start? When we're looking at the process, um, we figured out what kind, type of guardianship is needed and then we gotta figure out the forms. And in Ohio, we have 88 counties, right? So we have 88 different ways to do guardianships. So I always encourage people to make sure that you're looking at your specific county's forms and your specific county's rules, right? Because every probate court has its own set of local rules. Um, and beyond that, they also have their individual preferences, right? So we wanna make sure that we're looking to the local rules. We're looking at the local forms. There's always gonna be an, um, kind of a mix of the state forms and then local forms that um, different counties have added in to kind of supplement that. So uh, we have to look at the individual counties though. But essentially what you're gonna have is um, an application. That's kind of the, the, the cornerstone of it. Um, a lot of uh, counties are gonna have uh, some supplements that go along with the um, application. So maybe a supplement on the applicant. They want some more information than what the basic application will provide. And then oftentimes they're gonna to wanna to supplement on the, on the ward too. They want more information about what their life's like and what's going on and what the circumstances are so that they can get a better feel for what's happening. Um, we have to provide a statement of expert evaluation and our statement of expert evaluation has to be um, signed by a physician who has examined the ward within the prior three months. So within three months before applying for guardianship, this physician has to have um, examined the ward and then completed this, um, this statement of expert evaluation based on that examination. Um, one important thing to note that I oftentimes trips this up is that um, you know a lot of us see nurse practitioners, right? <laughs> which are which is lovely physicians assistants, assistants, all of those kinds of things that we're maybe able to get in a little bit easier and still receive great care. Um, these the statement of expert evaluation can be completed by them, but it has to be signed by a physician. So a physician has to come in and certify the report. So it does have to have a physician signature. Um, to, regardless of who who is filling it out. Um, and it has to be within that three months. If it's four months, you're going to have to figure out another way to get another appointment and uh, more more recent evaluation. Um, that statement of expert evaluation um, goes through it's a pretty long, pretty long document. It goes through um, some of the medical history related to the ward, you know, what diagnoses they have, what prescriptions they might be taking. Um, what the what the physician knows about the relationship between the ward and the prospective uh, prospective guardian. Um, it'll go through uh, different activities of daily living and the physician's opinion on on the ward's capability to do those things, both on the physical side of things, but also on um, the mental side of things. You know, do they have the capacity to handle finances and understand things and and things like that? So they'll go through that. Um, there's an opportunity to attach supplemental medical information or um, longer statements or things like that. And then at the end of it, it has a spot where the, the physician says, yes, I think a guardianship is appropriate or no, I don't think a guardianship is appropriate. Um, this comes in then as evidence of capacity, right? It's not determinative. The, the, the judge is the one that makes that final decision, but the judge uh, you know, does put a lot of weight on that statement of expert evaluation to make sure that from a medical perspective, they have 
a clear understanding of, of what's going on with that with that person. Um, if we have a guardianship of the estate, then the guardian is required to post a bond. And the bond is uh, double the value of the estate. So if I have a ward that has $100,000 and I'm applying to be the guardian, I need to post a bond that's worth $200,000 to secure my um, performance, right? <laughs> As an insurance uh, that I'm not going to abscond with this person's money and do the wrong thing. So bonds are usually just obtained through insurance companies. And so um, the necessary implication on that is that we have to have somebody applying to be guardian who is bondable. They have to have um, the credit worthy credit worthiness to be able to um, obtain a bond. Um, a background check is, re is required in all, um, all guardianship cases as well. So whether it's guardianship of the person or of the estate, we do have to file a, a background check. Different counties do have different levels of background checks that they require, but um, usually it's, you know, we do it through the sheriff's office, BCI background check, and we have it sent into the court so that they've got it for their records to make sure, again, that this applicant is the best person for the job and that we're not putting somebody in there that has um, a criminal history that might put them in a um, position of unworthiness to manage funds or something like that. Um, we also have to notify next of kin. So what this looks like is there's a what we call it Form 1.0 where we have to list the ward's closest living relatives, okay? So closest living relatives, if they have a spouse, we have to put the spouse down. If they have children, we have to put the children down. If they don't have a spouse and children, then it's gonna be parents and then siblings and nieces and nephews and so on and so forth. If anybody on that list has passed away but left children of their own, we still list them and then put their kids in there. So it's a, it's a pretty robust document. We have to, list who they are and their contact information, but then we also have to show that we've notified them of this of this guardianship proceeding. Um, that's how the court ensures that this isn't being done nefariously, right? We want to make sure that, um, you know, the assumption is that this person's family is in a position to help protect them. And so we want to make sure they're aware of what's happening so that if they need to raise a red flag, they have the opportunity to do so because they've been informed of what's happening. So that's why we have to do the, the next of kin notification. Um, and then whatever else the court might require, you know, they might want a drop of blood, a lock of hair, you know, <laughs> now of course they don't ask for those things, but they may have, you know, other, other forms, other um, supplements that we have to file with that. So it's a pretty, pretty decent sized package. And we gather all of that before applying because we have to have it all together before we file the application. And we can't file the application until the person turns 18. So um, what we're oftentimes working with with families, you know, who have kids that are coming to that age is maybe the three or four months ahead of their 18th birthday. Um, we're working with them to gather all of this information, get the statement of expert evaluation, get those background checks and bonds and anything else that's needed so that on that 18th birthday, we've got the package ready to walk up to the court and file that application. When we file the application, uh, the court is going to set it for hearing. So the hearing, the length of time between application and hearing is going to depend a lot on the county um, and how busy their docket is. Um, certainly in Montgomery County, they have a much busier, busier docket just being a bigger county. They also have um, several magistrates, so they have more manpower behind um, the, the group that's hearing these cases. So, um, um, but to contrast that with like Greene County, smaller county and there's only one judge and he doesn't have any magistrates so it does depend on kind of what the what the um, docket looks like green county typically we can get in a lot faster montgomery county will usually have a little bit more of a wait but it just depends on what's going on um, they won't set it right away because there is a requirement i think it's a two week two week requirement but um, essentially between the time that you file the application and when that hearing is going to be held the court is going to send out a court investigator to meet with the ward. So this is the court's chance to have their own set of eyes on the situation. You know, they've got the statement of expert evaluation and the application and all of the supplemental information that's been filed, but this is their chance to get their own eyes on the situation. And what that's going to look like is it's usually a very casual visit. It's usually very quick. Um, but they're, they're showing up and they're speaking with the ward to make sure that they understand, first of all, that a guardianship application has been filed. Um, and who's filed it. They'll an answer any questions that they have. They might, you know, just explain guardianship in general to them. 
and just kind of get a feel for the situation, right? Make sure they're, um, you know, not going to challenge it. Hey, do you need an attorney? Do you want to challenge this? You have the right to be there. You can bring anybody you want with you and just make sure that they're aware of their rights um, if there's any issues related to the application or if they have uh, an opposition to it. Um, and then they're also just getting their own set of eyes on the competency uh, side of things, that they're they're talking with the person and they're getting to uh, see for themselves kind of what the capacity is for understanding and participating in those kinds of conversations. And then based on that court investigator, uh, they will come back and fill out a court investigator's report, which becomes part of the record as well, that the judge will use um, to help determine whether this guardianship uh, will, will go forward. When we get to the hearing itself, um, if we have an uncontested guardianship where the ward isn't saying, no, I'm not incompetent, and we don't have anybody else competing to be the guardian, we don't have competing applications that the judge has to decide one, um, then these are really usually very informal and very casual. Um, the court goes a long way towards trying to make these as comfortable for the person as possible because it can be an intimidating experience. Um, most people don't have a whole lot of, um, of experience being in court and they, you know, it might be nerve wracking to go into it. So they really do a, a good job of trying to make it a little bit more relaxed and, and kind of um, help, uh, help people understand it along the way and make it more conversational than confrontational. Um, but the judge or magistrate uh, is going to kind of run the show. They're going to talk to the applicant first and ask them whatever questions they need to ask. You know, maybe just, hey, explain the circumstances. How did we get here? Or, hey, based on your application, you said this. Can you tell me more about, you know, this or that? And so um, just trying to make sure that the, the judge or the magistrate has a, a full picture of what's happening and what brought the brought everybody to the court that day. Um, but then they'll turn, turn and do that the same with the prospective ward. So the ward always has the right to attend the guardianship um, hearing if they choose to. Um, most of my clients end up bringing their kids um, I think it's, it can be a kind of a neat experience where, um, you know, again, it's not something that they often get the chance to do. So it can be kind of cool to see the courthouse and participate in something like that because it is informal and casual and not something that's confrontational and scary. Um, some of some of my clients have had a, a lot of fun with it. You know, they might get a tour of the courthouse afterwards and kind of make make more of a field trip kind of experience out of it. So, um, but if they're there, the, the court's going to talk with them. They're going to um, ask them about, hey, who is this lady? Is this your mom? Like, how are how are things with mom? And you know, do you want mom to help you out? And all of those kinds of things, just to kind of get again a, a good feel for the situation. Um, and then the final decision, based on all of the conversation. Um, the final decision will often be made from the bench that day, um, unless there's some kind of extenuating issue. Um, you know, if they need a follow-up statement of expert evaluation or if there is a competing application, they might take some time to make a ruling. But for most of our, our run-of-the-mill guardianship cases, uh, the judge is going to rule from the bench and say, well, you know, based on all of the evidence presented and the, um, and the conversation today, I'm appointing you as guardian and... Um, then they'll kind of walk through what your obligations are from there. You'll get what are called letters of authority, letters of guardianship that show um, that you are the guardian. They'll be stamped by the court and um, that's what you'll you'll use as proof. You know, that's what you give to the bank if you're the guardian of the estate to show you are the guardian. Or that's what you're giving to the doctor or the school so that you can still participate in IEPs and all of that. Uh, but those are pretty, pretty important things to have. And then um, from there, you have some obligations. So once somebody has been appointed guardian, um, there is an education process in Ohio. So um, Ohio law says that after somebody is appointed as guardian, they have a mandatory six hour course that they need to take um, within the first year of being appointed. After that, they have to take three hour courses annually. Um, the court can defer this education requirement. Different counties approach this differently. So what we oftentimes see, for example, in Greene County, usually if the, um, if the person that is being appointed as guardian is the natural parent of the ward, um, most of the time the court will defer education at that point. They'll, the judge usually says, and I should, I should preface this by saying the judge is my dad, so when I roll my eyes at what he says, it's not because I'm disrespecting a judge, I'm just dis disrespecting my dad, so big difference there. But um, he'll usually say, you know, you've been this person's parent for 18 years, who am I to tell you how to keep doing what you've been doing all along, which makes a lot of sense, right? Um, 
uh, but different counties do it differently. So Montgomery County's current status on that is typically that they will require the guardian to take the initial six hour course. Um, and after that, they can apply for a deferral. Okay, so uh, they can say, okay, I've taken this, I'm the parent, can I defer future education? And um, most of the time the, the court will allow them then to defer those ongoing annual education requirements. Keep in mind though that these are deferrals, they're not waivers. So as long as you stay um, compliant with all of the reporting that's required, then they will continue to defer it. But if you get into a position where maybe you're not filing your reports, or you're not doing things in a timely manner, or whatever the case might be, then the court might take that deferral away and say, okay, now you need to go in and do the guardian education because you need a better grasp on, on what's, what needs to be done here, okay? Um, beyond the, the education requirements, we also have these reports. So depending on the type of, gar or type of guardianship, whether it's a person or the estate or both, and again, depending on the county, we have um, a guardianship plan that is is going to be filed for a guardian of the person, which is just saying, hey, here's my plan. Here's how this. Here's how I plan to interact. Here's my goals. Here's, you know, we want to keep them ha happy, healthy, and safe. And, and here's all the ways we're going to do that. Um, and then a guardianship report, which is usually filed every two years. Some counties have it every year. Um, this is just saying, kind of, here's how the plan went. Right? <laughs> Was I successful in this? Uh, it, are there changed circumstances that the court needs to know about because the, you know the guardian the ward is doing better or maybe they're doing worse or whatever whatever might happen um, most of those guardianship reports they do say that they have to ha be presented with an additional statement of expert evaluation but again most of the time um, the court will defer those or waive those continued statements of expert evaluation as long as there's not a change in the condition so if it's a pretty stable condition that there's not really a likelihood of improvement or change then they'll waive them but they'll say if there is a change you need to get me an additional one so most of the time we can avoid some of that that extra extra legwork there um, when we're dealing with guardianships of the estate, uh, within 90 days after the guardian, guardian is appointed, we have to file with the court a full inventory of all of the property that the guardian or that the ward owns so that the court knows what's subject to the guardianship of the estate. We have to get it secured in a guardianship account and take all of these steps. And then um, as funds need to be used, so we've got all of this money, it's now set up in a guardianship account and I need to be able to use it for the ward. Um, the guardian can't use any of those funds without the court's prior permission, okay? So maybe that looks like, oh, his rent is going to be this amount every single month for, you know, perpetuity. We just file something with the court and say, this is an ongoing expense. Do I have permission to pay this on an ongoing basis? So we usually do those for, you know, all of your rent and utilities and just regular things. Um, and then as more extraordinary things come up, like, hey, here's a, he needs a new bicycle or he needs... He wants to go on this trip can we use money for this then we're going in and making separate applications to the court for those things because the court has to say that yes you have the permission to do that before you're able to do it because again this, the court is the superior guardian and the guardian is just the liaison um, and then there's also an accounting that needs to be filed um, and that accounting is showing to the penny here's where we started here's where we ended and here's everything that happened in between so that the court can see that these funds weren't being used for things other than what the court said it could be used for and we can see how it's invested and how it's growing or how you know what losses there are so that the court can keep a keep a solid eye on 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 what's happening there but the reporting on the guardianship of the estate is a lot more in depth just because we're dealing with with assets all right, that's the guardianship side of things. And uh, Patty mentioned this earlier, but I, I, it, it bears repeating. Um, don't ever forget about your own plan, okay? Because I know it's so easy as parents to focus on your kids and just, what do I need for them? What do I need for them? And then we forget to put our own oxygen mask on, right? Um, but having a plan for yourself, especially as a caregiver, not just as a parent, but as a caregiver, is really important for having a plan for your, uh, just as important as having a plan for your beneficiary. Um, so you want to make sure you've got your own powers of attorney and healthcare directives <clears throat> that you have appropriate insurance, whether it's disability insurance or long term care insurance or life insurance or whatever you need to make sure that you can be taken care of so that you're still able to take care of your loved one. It's really important. 
and then have nominations within your documents as who's going to be taking over if you're not able to anymore. You know, who are you nominating to be the successor guardian if something happens and you're not able to do it? Um, who is going to be, you know, the trustee of a special needs trust if you're setting up a special needs trust for your kid or whatever the case might be. Have, um, you know, have a deeper look into your own plan to make sure that how your plan impacts your kid is going to work the way that you want it to and that you're not forgetting yourself and then actually throwing everything else for quite a big loop. Um, so just remember that, uh, you know, like I said, if, if somebody's, if you're alive and you become incompetent, um, if something happens to you, it's hard as it is if you, if you don't have extra extra special circumstances, but when you're the caregiver for an adult child with developmental disabilities or whatever might be going on, it can be huge. It can be hugely detrimental because now we not only have a sick parent, but we've got a child who's without a caregiver. And so having a proactive plan in place and having the right insurance in place to fund all of that and all of those things can be really, really critical to make sure that a difficult time is going to be made as easy as we can possibly make it if something like that happens. So I'm going to go to the chat here. Um, more information on guardianship, so good. That's not a question. Just more and more of a resource for you. So make sure that you go to that link and get uh, get some of the extra information that's there. But um, really, for my purposes, that is the quick and dirty overview of powers of attorney and guardianships. Does anybody else have any questions or any um, anything I can go back and clarify on any of this? I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully it was helpful. Um, Brittany, one of the things when you had mentioned the continuing education, um, for those to find it like in their particular county, they would go to the probate website. Is that correct? Look under yeah. guardianship and then probably most, like a education. Most probate court websites do have links to it. Um, I think most of the guardian education is done through the Ohio Supreme Court. So they have a statewide so it's not county by county that does their own education. It's just they're linking to the statewide programs. They are free. They are offered online. They try to make them as easy and as accessible as, as possible. So you're not having to, you know, take time off work to go to a six hour course or anything like that. And I think that link for the Supreme Court, I think that's in the lie binder. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Um, but then there's also in the salt. Google Drive, where you'll find this presentation, we have mm -hmm. uploaded it. There's also, I have Montgomery County had given me some time ago, you know, their it's education. Montgomery yeah. County. So it's in there if you're from Montgomery County, but for your specific county, you know, you can go to these other links for, um, as Brittany mentioned, it's free. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions? You can put it in the chat. Um, I am still recording. I'm going to um, turn off the recording here in a few minutes so people can open up if they're not comfortable with asking while being recorded. Um, while you're thinking about questions, one one of the things I was thinking about, um, or a couple things <laughs> I was thinking about, um, so how often do how often do you recommend these documents? So let's just say um, like a POA. How often do you usually like um, redo them? Like you know, this, yeah. you know, in a couple of years, like five years, you know, you get one done, and in five years, like how often is it good to redo yeah. those, or will, or something like that? With the power of attorney, because we're having the issues with banks um, putting putting a timeline on those that legally they they don't expire. But if a bank is saying that they're going to expire, I think a good um, good benchmark is to have them evaluated every three to five years. Mm -hmm. um, three years is what we've been recommending to our clients, but um, it doesn't re require that you're necessarily redoing and rethinking the whole thing. A lot of times what we're doing is just refreshing them. We're just putting a new date on them and having you sign it again so that you've got a more current document that it's more likely to be accepted. With the other documents though, with your will and uh, trusts and things like that, um, I, I always recommend every, every year or two, read through it, make sure you still have the right people named in the right roles and everything still makes sense for your circumstances as they exist at that time. And then every three to five years, sit down with your attorney and review it so that you can make sure that from a legal perspective, there's nothing that's changed that might impact your, your decisions there and that we can make sure it's healthy on both sides of the coin there. 
I know in the Dayton area and down, you know, in the Southwest Ohio, there is several military. Mm -hmm. So let's just say they do have, um, whether it be guardianship or a will or a POA in place, and then they get transferred or moved to another state. What is the situation like? Do those documents still, are they still valid? Do they become invalid? You know, what is, what happens when you move like that? So with a guardianship, if there's a guardianship in place when somebody moves and the the ward is moving as well, um, first of all, you have to tell the court first. You have to get permission to move. Um, can't move the ward to a more restrictive setting or a different setting. You have to make sure that they're informed. Um, but you can transfer guardianships. So county to county, state to state, there are processes to transfer it. Um, Sometimes it's super smooth and doesn't take a whole lot. Sometimes it feels like you're redoing the whole process, but it all depends on how those two courts processes really link up together. Um, we've had some that come from South Carolina that was just super simple. We've had other ones where we you know, came from other states and really had to kind of go back to square one and, and go through the whole process again. So it kind of depends on that. But with the documents, um, I always recommend when I've got clients that are moving to a new state, um, your your documents will follow you, okay? Your will is still valid. Um, so if I have an Ohio will and I move to North Carolina, my Ohio will is still valid, but North Carolina law is going to be applied to it. So I need to make sure that my will is going to do what I need it to do under North Carolina law, right? The difference with the trust is that with a trust, you get the choice of law. So I ha if I have an Ohio trust and I become a North Carolina resident, um, Ohio law is still going to be applied to my trust um, unless I change the situs of administration to North Carolina. So unless I amend my trust to say now North Carolina law applies. But I always recommend that people sit down and talk with a, an estate planning attorney in their new state just to make sure that, you know, if there are nuances in that state's law that you need to take advantage of, update your documents so that they'll say what you need them to say. I think that's good because I know um, several times um, I have had people reach out and say, now what do I do? I, I, a guy moved and I, now what do I do? And it's, and I have to ref I'll refer him back to, you know, one of you wonderful speakers that <laughs> can advise them on what do they do now? Yeah. Um, I don't see any other additional um, questions in the chat. So I'm going to stop the recording so people can open up if they would feel more comfortable with that. But just before I close, just Thank you, Brittany, again, for speaking. We made it through without the storm taking out anything. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so, um, but I want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. It, it's so clear. And this presentation will be uploaded to our SALT Google Drive. And thank you for all those who are attending. But let me turn off the recording. And then for those who want to just unmute, you can ask your question if you don't want to type it. But we'll be on here for you know a, a couple more minutes to help answer your questions. One second. 